Hello, I'm attorney Todd Leneve. Welcome to West Virginia Gun Law. Today I wanted to take a few minutes to talk with you about ridiculous firearms takes and the response of the Second Amendment community. Stick around. Those are just a few uh, fairly well-known comments made in the public by elected representatives over the past 10 years or so. They illustrate, though, the issue that I wanted to talk about today, and that is the general lack of knowledge that we so often see with the anti-Second Amendment community when they stand in front of a podium or a camera and have an opportunity to make statements in support of their agenda to curtail the Second Amendment rights of everyday Americans. We so often see these people make statements that have absolutely no basis in fact that it becomes laughable for us as gun-supporting Americans, but the reality is that the people who support that anti-gun agenda often don't have any personal knowledge or experience with firearms. And so they hear these people make these foolish comments, these outlandish statements about facts about firearms, and they believe these things like they were gospel. So I think it's really important to understand our responsibility as Second Amendment supporters in not only being responsible with our use and exercise of firearms rights under the Second Amendment, but also dealing with the people who are in our own circles in a way that helps better educate them as to the reality of firearms and what they do, why they're nothing more than a useful tool, and it's all in the manner of their handling by the individual who holds them that creates the problems that we see uh, in our society. You know, interestingly, when we talk about these foolish takes on, on firearms issues, just yesterday, February 28th, the case of Garland v. Cargill was argued in the United States Supreme Court. For those who are familiar, this is the case that deals with the bump stock ban. For those who don't know what a bump stock is, just very briefly, it's an attachment that can be added to a rifle, a semi-automatic rifle, that when used correctly can increase the rate of fire or the speed with which you can fire rounds out of that rifle. Now the bump stock does not change the trigger, it doesn't change the function of the trigger, there still has to be a single trigger pull for every round that's fired out of that rifle, but it does enable the shooter who's using it correctly to be able to fire a little more rapidly than they could without that bump stock. So the real issue in this case yesterday was surrounding that concept of whether the trigger function has been changed or not by the addition of a bump stock to a rifle. At one point, the government lawyer, arguing in favor of the ban, made the statement that a bump stock equipped rifle is capable of firing, get this, 600 rounds per second. Then even more amazingly, Justice Jackson, later in the argument, several times made the comment that these bump stock equipped rifles could fire as much as 800 rounds per second. The reality is, folks, that these rifles can't even come anywhere near that kind of a rate of fire. Most civilian-owned rifles are totally incapable of anything approaching that number. We may be able to find a machine gun that could be legally owned by a civilian that could fire several hundred rounds per minute, 
but to say that we have a device that can be bought over the counter, added to a firearm, and cause it to fire up to 800 rounds per second is just bad information. And so it makes me begin to question where this information comes from. Are these people who are making these comments just truly that stupid? Or are they being deliberately deceptive in the things that they say about firearms or firearms accessories? I'm not sure which one's worse, but the end effect is the same. We get bad information and we put it out in front of a camera and people who support that agenda or who may be sympathetic to that agenda absolutely buy into it hook, line, and sinker. But I think the worst outcome is for people who maybe don't have a particular position on the topic. And in the case here, we're talking about the, the anti-gun community. Every one of us, I'm sure, knows somebody who doesn't really care one way or another about firearms. But a lot of those people, when they begin to hear these facts spewed constantly after, you know, person after person after person says them out on social media and, you know, the news and online, they begin to buy into this false narrative. And what's the likely outcome? Well, at some point, they probably will become anti-gun themselves because all they hear is, well, my gosh, who needs a firearm that'll fire 800 rounds per second? Aside from the fact that it would be really cool to have one that was capable of doing that, the reality is that that's not what's out on our streets, and those aren't even the kind of things that are being used by the people who are going out and committing these crimes. So you take somebody who maybe previously had no position on the issue, and now they've been fed misinformation, and they develop this negative connotation about firearms, and suddenly the anti-gun lobby has created another person, another voice, another vote on their side of the issue. So as the Second Amendment community, what do we do about this? Well, I just had the fortune uh, last week to actually have a conversation with somebody I've known for years, but I didn't realize they were anti-gun in the sense that they've never owned a firearm, have never felt the need to, and have always felt that they were a little bit dangerous and scary. And so this person had reached out to me uh, to ask a question about firearms and you know, my position on why I support the Second Amendment right in a pretty much unrestricted manner completely. And we had a really good conversation. And by the end of that conversation, this person acknowledged that their anti-gun position, they weren't necessarily in support of firearms bans, but they were definitely anti-gun in their worldview. But we were able to, by the end of that conversation, take this person and change their ideas about what the the firearm world is all about, about what the Second, uh, Second Amendment community really stands for. And as it turns out, I'm going to be able to work with this person and their family here probably in the next month or so when the weather gets nicer, take them out to a range, and introduce them to shooting. And I am thrilled about the opportunity to be able to do that. And it's the kind of thing that all of us in the Second, Commandment, the Second Amendment community ought to be looking for those kind of chances to help somebody who doesn't know much about guns, who maybe has an interest, or who maybe is just curious to know why we have such a passion about them, they're out there. And again, they're in your circles, just as they're in my circles. At the end of the day, if we've done it correctly, maybe we've won somebody over to the Second Amendment cause, and we've got somebody now who will vote in support of Second Amendment issues, or vote in, in support of candidates who will support Second Amendment issues. Don't be a turnoff, be an advocate, be a supporter for the Second Amendment, and make a difference in the circle around you, in your local community, and the more of us that are willing to do that, the better off we're all going to be in the long run as we build support and understanding based on real facts, not made up things that absolutely paint the Second Amendment community and firearms in a negative light. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the channel. Hit that like button, share the video with friends and family. Let's get the word out and make sure that people know that we have a chance to positively impact the pro-gun community through our own actions, through our own choices, and the way that we deal with those who don't have a real familiarity with the topic. I appreciate you spending a few minutes with me, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Until then, take care.